I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. Today's show was developed in partnership with the American Leadership Forum. Government budgets, they've been stretched like never before. That makes a big difference in what we expect from local governments and what government can actually provide. And it's not likely to get any better anytime soon. Joining us today to understand local government finance and how it affects our lives are members of three city councils. Rob Fong of Sacramento, Tom Cosgrove of Lincoln, and Tom Stallard of Woodland. Welcome to Studio Sacramento. So tell me, are we facing a fundamental change in what government delivers? Oh, Scott, I really believe we are. Uh, we're not in the same world we were in just a few years ago, but we were spending uh, up to a level of economy that just doesn't seem to exist, or will not for some period of time. So in the case of Woodland, uh, we've had to drop five million dollars from our 39 million dollar general fund in the last uh, three years and Tuesday we're facing 1.4 million dollars of additional cuts this has had dramatic differences in what we can do in our city and and how will it impact on on the ground for the individual residents what are they not going to see well naturally we've done everything we can to minimize what they don't see but we've had to take some extraordinary measures we've dropped over 100 full-time equivalent positions in the city of Woodland. Uh, we've had to reduce library hours dramatically and even had to contemplate the possibility of closing the library. But to, to maintain some uh, level of minimal services, we actually uh, went out to our citizens for a quarter cent sales tax for a four-year period, and that's helped us bridge the gap. You mean they actually passed it? They actually passed it. We told them that we needed it minimally in order to keep the library open and to do some essential other services, and the citizens responded. So, Tom Cosgrove, what's the story in Lincoln? Well, not surprisingly, it's very similar to what's happened in Woodland and other cities. Uh, some of the differences, though, is a while ago we did go out to the community for a utility user tax, which they turned down. So instead, our path has been really at reducing costs. Uh, the general fund is the area where we have the biggest challenge financially. We've reduced fire staffing, police staffing, in order to make our budget balance. We've dropped over $6 million out of our general fund budget, which was a $16 million budget. Mm -hmm. So we're probably 35, 37% uh, smaller in our general fund than we used to be. Rob Fong, when, you, when Tom Cosgrove talks about the amount that's being dedicated to police and fire, how does that compare with the city of Sacramento? Well, for the city of Sacramento with our uh, discretionary general fund, um, the police and fire service are about 85% of that budget. 85%. So right. you only have 15 cents out of every dollar to spend on everything else. Sure. Yes, that's true in terms of the discretionary general fund. Mm -hmm. I, I, what people don't understand is there's obligations we have to pay that we don't have discretion over, but the things that the council will set policy over, yeah, uh, we only have 15 cents left out of every dollar uh, to talk about the rest of the city. That doesn't sound like it leaves you much wiggle room in terms of planning for the needs of the future as well as taking care of the needs of today. Well, it doesn't. I mean, you asked the question, Scott, I mean, are we seeing a fundamental shift in the way cities uh, deliver services? And, uh, and talking to uh, my colleagues in the green room, you know, we're all sort of in the same boat in terms of what the percentages are. You know, Sacramento is a big city, uh, but the percentages are, are the same in terms of police and fire service, roughly. And, uh, you know, one of the things we're going to have to continue to ask ourselves is, um, you know, as cities, are, are we in the business of providing uh, anything beyond police and fire services? Obviously, you know, everyone's, uh, I think, absolutely justifi justifiably concerned with public safety, but there's a lot more that goes into being a city, I think, um, whether it's parks, recreation, code enforcement, planning, development, economic development, all those things uh, that we can, you know, see as the revenue side. Well, and part of the question is, is whether or not, in terms of what we're paying for in terms of public safety, regardless of jurisdiction, is, 
are the numbers right in terms of what the expectations are? In other words, does more police and fire necessarily mean less crime and faster response times? You know, I, I guess it all depends who you ask. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think that um, anytime um, you're running uh, an enterprise, whether it's a city, a business, or anything else, and you're in a uh, sort of massive budget freefall where the revenues are just not coming in year over year, mm -hmm. you know, obviously one way to approach it is to cut services. But I think uh, ultimately, um, if 85% of your budget, the lion's share of your budget is, is two services, I think it only makes sense to look at um, you know, efficiencies and, and sort of you know, kind of whiteboard and say, if we were starting over today, what should the police department look like? What should the fire service look like? And you know, what kind of service should we expect, service level? Mm -hmm. uh, is the fire department still a fire department or is it an ambulance service? You know, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, I, I think that um, those, are the, those are the places we need to start going. Well, let's talk about that whiteboard for a second. Mm. Tom Stallard, <laughs> I want to ask you the question. How did we get here in the first place? Because if we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, I think most would agree that we'd probably have local governments look a little bit different than they do today. I think that's definitely the case. I think probably we all need to realize that just like the business community itself, local government has gotten caught up in, in, a, in a spending uh, paradigm uh, based on conditions which have ceased to exist. So we've seen a lot of our private sector businesses go away as we much, much to our regret. But in government, we don't go away. We're still there, but we have less money to do what people have always expected us to do. In the case of Woodland, we have 56,000 shareholders. Uh, they expect services. They want that library. They want their parks to look nice. Uh, they want good police and fire protection. But we now have a whole lot less money to do it. So it's time to rethink the whole organization. And we are starting to do that in Woodland. We want to re-envision ourselves and think what we are and what we need to be and how we need to get there. So we have had to reduce staff. We've actually had to contract out some services in consequence of staff reductions. And we still are willing to look at anything and everything to help us get to where we need to go. Tom Cosgrove, you have done a lot of work with the regional government structure known as SACOG and the like. There, there's been for years a discussion about regionalizing government in order to spread efficiencies. Now, while some things happen maybe contractually between smaller cities and the is there anything other than informal cooperation going on right now that's meaningful, that moves the needle? I believe there's just ongoing discussions about consolidation of services and trying to minimize the overlap of services between communities. I think that's a discussion that's been taken far more seriously recently than it has been in the past. The, uh, you asked the question, uh, regional government. I don't think so another layer of government isn't necessarily going to be the solution. Imagine. Well, what about the elimination <laughs> of, the, of the more local levels of government and moving everything up so that way you're actually consolidating? It, it's ironic you mentioned that, but on the other hand, the state is moving the opposite direction and really? arguing to push services down to the local level. A good example is moving prisoners from state prison to county jails. The dilemma with that is that unless the ongoing revenue, the money to provide uh, for those services at the county jail uh, continue to exist, then we will be stressed at a greater level, at the local level, to provide those types of services or let people go free into the community that otherwise used to be in prison. It's an ironic situation. The state is arguing that it's the local jurisdictions that should be doing better at providing the services, yet at the same time the discussion is how to regionalize. That's kind of an oxymoron in terms of a discussion. And, and Rob, when it comes to this push down from the state to local governments, right now the discussion, at least as it, it has been at the state level, is, is that we're, we're just trying to rationalize the, the delivery of services. Is that just another name for pushing unfunded mandates down to the local level? Well, you know, it all depends, Scott. I mean, if you're, uh, you don't have any county folks here, but I think um, people who, who are serving at the county level would tell you that they have all these mandates that are unfunded that they've got to kind of figure out. Um, I think from a city's perspective, you know, we're sort of all in the same business. Um, and, 
you know, I, my feeling is um, if, if services are going to be delivered locally and we're responsible for them, um, it would be nice if we could control the revenue picture uh, mm -hmm. to a greater degree. And so I'm going to say the taxes word. But, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that um, these wheels were set in motion a long time ago with Proposition 13. Uh, frankly, um, I'm a recovering school board member. I'm mm -hmm. a city council uh, member now. But, um, you know, Prop 13 was passed in 1978, and one could argue that was the, the decline of, of the public school system, you know, kind of fall, fell on the heels of that or followed on the heels of that. It's, um, you know, it's so I think it's difficult to uh, be charged with the, uh, you know, kind of creating a level of expectation uh, for a certain municipality if your hands are tied in terms of what you can spend on it. You know, we keep talking about the cost of services, and I get that we need to, but the reason we keep talking about that is because we can't talk about the other side of that. We really don't have any say on the revenue side. Well, let's talk about that for a second. Uh, Tom, you have been really focused on the issue of the history that has gotten us here, and some of the, the strange results that have taken place, like the fiscalization of land use policy and like. Can you speak to this? Yes. Uh, because cities do not control their revenue stream, uh, they're the only place where they can hopefully expand their revenues through sales tax. And so what that means is every jurisdiction is fighting for sales tax generator, whether it's car <coughs> dealers or furniture stores or any kind of uh, sales tax generator. And that it's what we call fiscalization of land use. So, for example, Woodland said yes to a major expansion of retail on its eastern edge in order to bring in Costco and other options like that. And we have had another major proposal brought before us as well. It's very tempting, but it may not be good planning. And so jurisdictions are constantly jockeying uh, for these sales tax generators. Mm -hmm. and how can you blame us when you consider the fact that we're, we're basically starving in terms of revenue to provide mm -hmm. the services we want? I mentioned earlier about cutting back. I mean, what we, we only have one library in Woodland. It's now only open 44 hours a week. It's not open at all on Fridays. It's not open on Sundays. Uh, and yet, we have a computer room in there that's filled any time that library is open. People using those computers to look for jobs. So these are important services. Well, interesting you should say that. I was with the head of the local libraries here in Sacramento. And she said that at a 4 o'clock in the afternoon, every day, Monday right. through Friday, yeah. I, I guess we still have Monday through Friday here in mm -hmm. the city of Sacramento, that kids are flooded in there for after school work, you know, to do their homework, to, you know, get on the computer because they may not have access at home and the like. And so we do have this expectation of services. Now, in your case, your residents voted for some sort of fee increase in order to keep that library open. Exactly. But one of the challenges has been that we have not been able, Rob, to mm -hmm. necessarily get the public to step up on the revenue side of the equation as you were speaking to. You think that is going to change anytime soon? Well, I think it's difficult if all you're left with is uh, asking for an increase in the sales tax or something like that. And, and I want to kind of revisit what Tom was just saying because it's very important. I mean, we can be focused right now on the basics of how are we going to afford the services we'd like to provide. But from a policy standpoint, I completely agree with Tom in that because all we have is sales tax and some portion of the property tax, which by the way doesn't exist anymore, uh, if, you, you know, if everyone kind of recognizes the loss in value uh, in their homes, um, it, it means that um, you're making land use decisions which affect, I think, uh, are just as important in terms of our futures, in terms of what our cities look like, in terms of what our county looks like, um, based solely on we need the money, right. right? Not is, should this store be here? Should this car dealer be here? Um, and it really flies in the face of, of what SACOG, I think, has been uh, incredibly effective at, which is sort of regionalizing transportation. You know, there's so many issues, including land use, air quality, watershed well, let's talk that should about, be regional. Yeah, well let's talk about another one of those. Tom, the, the loss of the tool of redevelopment <laughs> currently, that has been uh, one of the few uh, levers that local governments could use in order to advance significant projects. Now obviously the city has a significant project that it's considering right now with the Arena and Entertainment Center, but for, for small governments as well, for small cities and counties, they have been using redevelopment for years. 
What happens next? We're still trying to figure all that out because, quite frankly, the, the state hasn't figured out yet what they're going to do or how they're going to do it. So that kind of leaves us in limbo. But our approach now has been, and I, I want to back up first of all to say that all three of our cities, I think, have done an excellent job using redevelopment as a tool to improve our communities, uh, improve our downtowns, our more blighted areas, and the argument that there, there's egregious... So um, why wasn't the governor listening to you three then when he made the decision to get well, rid of uh, And I'll come back to the comment, fiscalization of land use. Mm -hmm. uh, really, Prop 13 was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. We've had to learn how to live within that. Mm -hmm. The way we've done that is to focus on sales tax. To me, that's, the term fiscalization of land use has got a, gotten a very negative connotation to it, and the reality is it's a tool that communities use to plan financially. And it's necessary for us to be able to do that. It's consistent with SACOG in the sense that we want to have local folks being able to shop local and do their business local. I think those are good. But it provides revenue for the local community to provide those services too. To come back to redevelopment, the bigger challenge that we're going to have is the, house, the affordable housing elements of redevelopment that I believe will still be a burden that local jurisdictions are going to have to carry. We just won't have the resources to do it, money to do well, it. Well, actually, in many discussions, it's been said that affordable housing just isn't going to happen. It it's is. dead because without those, those types of units without any subsidy of any sort just don't pencil to, uh, for being built. Actually, Scott, uh, the state of California puts a requirement for a minimum level of affordable housing on each jurisdiction in the state. So somehow it's going to have to happen. We just don't know how we're going to pay for it. And, and the shame of it is, is that all of our jurisdictions, I can speak specifically for Lincoln, our focus has been putting families into homes that they own, home ownership. Now that improves in a community when you have folks mm -hmm. living in a home that they own, they're invested in the community, they take pride in their community. They become a greater part of our community. I don't see that happening in the future given the direction of redevelopment at this point. Well, let, let's talk about this mandate that for affordable housing that the state has put down, but yet taken away the tools to be able to do that. It almost sounds like the biblical Ten Commandments where it is that Pharaoh took away the straw to make bricks, but still expected the Hebrews to, build, to make the bricks for the pyramids, right? That's a very good analogy because <laughs> that's essentially where local government finds itself these days. Responsibilities, but no revenue. So, so to build on this, Rob, what frustrates you most as a longtime city councilman and person who has done a lot at various levels of government um, at the local level to invest and build the community? What frustrates you most about the relationship that local governments have with the state? Well, you know, I think it's, um, it's easy to sort of criticize what's happening at the state level. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is um, you know, the federal government, um, you know, we, we're struggling as a nation uh, with our economy. We're, the world is struggling with its economy. It's, mm -hmm. We live in a global economy now. You know, the state uh, is uh, forever finding itself trying to uh, kind of deliver on the promises it's made to all of us. And, you know, they have very similar problems in terms of their revenue outlook. And, um, you know, so to me, I, I guess, you know, kind of answer your early question, what about redevelopment? You know, I'm confident that some form of redevelopment will come back to us um, through the state. It just has to. Uh, you know, I think the, uh, the powers that be that didn't care for it in, in its current or just past iteration felt like there were too many abuses. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think those, um, you know, those are valid criticisms, but we've done a lot of good. And so, you know, from my standpoint, um, you know, kind of to answer your very early question, which is, are we in a new place? I don't think we are. Really? No, I don't. I think that everything's a cycle. I think that, you know, uh, it's new for us, uh, perhaps. I mean, everyone talks about, uh, anytime you run into a public official, they think that their recession was the most significant, <laughs> right? Oh, you should have been here in the 80s or, gee, the 90s. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think for, for Sacramento and, and probably for the region, mm -hmm. you know, we're sort of, we've been a, a government uh, services uh, economy with housing, right? You know that. Oh, yes. 
And um, it's cyclical. And you talk about affordable housing, some people would tell you that affordable housing exists now because the market's really corrected itself. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the answers are, Scott, but I think that um, it's sort of all of our charge to kind of work within the existing rules and to, to improve upon it where we can. And, you know, someone way smarter than me told me you never want to waste a good crisis. So to me, um, you know, we're not getting out of this anytime soon. I would grant you all that. I mean, you don't have to be a genius to figure that out, but I think that we need to be smarter. So how can we not waste this crisis, though? What are some of the things that if, if you were king and could wave the magic wand, what, how could we maximize the value of this crisis? You know, I think we need to continue to invest in our people, whether they're our citizens, our employees, our neighbors, our friends. I think we need to um, sort of insist on a stronger sense of community, uh, sort of change the culture of how we think and talk. And then I think it's really important um, for those people who are charged with this, and in our case, it's our city manager who's um, one of his big things uh, this year, and he used to lead the Redevelopment Association, uh, is to um, kind of take a look at how the city is structured, how it delivers services, how we do business. And I'm hoping that in that discussion, we start to get at, you know, um, are there duplications of effort? Uh, do some things exist that don't need to exist? And is there a better and different way to do the things to deliver the services that our folks want and need. And I think that those are some of the ways we can be uh, sort of getting ready for that moment when things start to look better. Well, Tom Cosgrove, I, I want to ask you about this. Let, let's stay with the theme of never wasting a good crisis. <laughs> One of the intractable things that many government officials and observers focus on is the fact that government employment and its compensation and all of the attendant benefits are unsustainable in the long term. What types of changes do you think are going to be required in order to essentially right size the compensation, pension, health care systems of government employees so that that way we can take advantage of building, as Rob says, for the future? Some of those steps have already been taken. Uh, in our community we've shifted the PERS employee cost back to the employee. Uh, we've not had any, any increases. Uh, we're negotiating with our labor groups right now. And one of the focuses is shifting a portion of the health care costs back to the employee as well. We cover 100% of the cost at this point. Uh, so there will be uh, a change in that direction. It's going to hurt the pocketbooks of the employees. There's no question. Let me, let me just jump in and ask you a question on that, though. It has always been this social pact that the reason that government employees enjoyed higher benefit packages and defined pensions, even though for those in the private sector they don't enjoy those things, is because ultimately the wages were so far were so low in comparison to the for-profit private sector. In both the entry level and, and at some of the mid-levels, there are observers who say that that's just not quite true. Mm -hmm. And so that's partially what's driving the conversation on reordering that basic financial relationship with government employees. Tom, how do you respond to that? Well, I, I think you speak accurately, Scott. I, I think uh, compensation levels in, at municipal governments have, have, raised, have gone up over the years substantially, and now uh, with the benefit structure and the compensation structure, there is room for rethinking. Uh, in, our, in the case of our city, we are using some of the same strategies that Tom mentioned. Uh, we're also uh, going to two-tier retirements. We've already done it with our police unit, and we're beginning our fire negotiations this year, and that's one of our key expectations. So I think we just sort of built up a cost structure based on old style of doing things that doesn't fit anymore. Uh, I agree largely with uh, what you said, Rob, about uh, you know this is just another part of cycling. But I also think the world isn't going to be in the same place after this recession that it was before this recession. And government has a way of just taking on more responsibilities and never shedding any. So we really have to evaluate what we're doing and how we're doing it. And that's what we're trying to do. All right. Government. We're in, down to our final minute. And so <clears throat> I want to close with this question for each of you. Expectations for the future. Mr. Stollard, we're going to give you uh, the first uh, opening on that. First of all, I love local government. I mean, it's really the purest form of democracy we have. We're closest to the people. Mm -hmm. I love it. We work with them. My slogan is put the unity back in community. Let's do some things that don't cost money. Let's work on fitness programs. Let's work on community councils around the parks we have in our community. So I think we have opportunities to bring people together and do things that are important for them that don't necessarily have such large cost factors. Mr. Cosgrove. Um, <clears throat> 
very good comments. I believe two things have to happen. One is, at the local level, we have to simplify government. We, we have to be able to explain to our community the enterprise funds and why the fees are such that they are and they operate like a business. And then the discretionary uh, funding that we have in our general fund in particular and how we're going to manage that. I don't think it's complicated. I think it's actually very easy to understand. And the second is, you'd ask about waving a wand earlier uh, when and we talked. And you've got five seconds to wave that wand. <laughs> Get the state government out of our way. Every time they pass a law, add a new requirement that costs local government, they're interfering with our ability to be able to do our job. All right. Mr. Fong, you get the last word. You know, I, I just think that um, it's all about changing people's expectations, and I think we're going to need uh, all of our citizens to be, you know, good neighbors um, to each other, and I, I think that would breed uh, sort of more involvement uh, uh, on, on a daily basis. And I think that we're going to have to trim back uh, the amount of services we actually deliver, but I think that can be made up by people actually doing things for each other. And that is a perfect note to leave it on. Thank you all very much. Well, that's our show. Thanks to our guests, Rob Fong, Tom Cosgrove, and Tom Stallard for talking with us today. There's lots of talk on television, but only a few places where the conversations matter. I'm Scott Syfax, and you've been watching Studio Sacramento. Join us next time right here on KVIE. I'm James Beckwith, President and CEO of Five Star Bank. As a community bank, we believe that open dialogue about the issues affecting our region is vitally important. From the economy to the environment to social issues, we look forward to the conversations and hope you'll join in.